dance for joy or lost hope. So welcome to uh, Sensible Second Hand Classics, the uh, show where we look at uh, nostalgic cars that are over 15 years old that you can buy for a budget of between one and five thousand pounds. This is a 1971 Hillman Super Imp and yes it is the same Hillman Super Imp that Seth and my driver classic drove at the Great British Car Journey in 2021 because I am at the Great British Car Journey and uh, it's uh, very charming. So the Hillman Imp was quite a departure um, from what routes have been making when it was launched in 1963. Brand new factory, brand new workforce, um, engine was uh, developed for this car from a fire pump engine made by a company called Coventry Climax. They hadn't competed in this market segment before. So rear engine and rear wheel drive complete opposites so like a Mini which it was meant to compete against. Drive position is better than a Mini, it's not perfect, you can't adjust these seats at all and so I, I am really feeling like I'm too tall for this. All synchro mesh gearbox although this gearbox is still very very sort of reluctant to actually kind of go into gears and um, we'll have to just try going up in seconds so I don't have to fiddle with it, there we go. The steering is really really light like stupidly light it's, it's sort of lighter than most cars are these days so that is very very light it's quite easy to control although i'm a little bit concerned that the back end is going to slide out around this roundabout uh, but no it's not doing it today which is which is good but the engine that most of these imps and imp derivatives and we, we will go through the full list of imp derivatives and there are many 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 imp derivatives um, was an 875cc version of this Coventry Climax engine, developing 39 horsepower. The Imp Sport also had the um, 875 engine, and that developed 51 horsepower. Now you could get sort of like a kit, effectively, to, with a 998 engine. If you use the, I think it was a cylinder head from the Imp Sport, you could get about 65 horsepower. But so many of them had. Um, site tunings and if you look at a site called um, Imps Forever which is a fantastic site full of information about these cars then you can see you know what people have done to them making them for rallies and all sorts of things like that apparently they're very successful in competition back in the day I'm just sort of pottering around town and you used to this gearbox the throw of the gearbox is extremely short it's very very different from something like a mini um, then it's not too bad, you know, it's probably a bit stiff because it's really, really cold today. But yeah, it seems willing enough. It actually makes quite a good noise as well. I mean, this is just the basic one. I'm sure if you put a nice fruity exhaust on this, it'd be, it'd be even better. I checked with uh, one of my uncles last night when I was uh, visiting him about whether or not my family used to own one of these back in the 70s, and yes they did, they had, a, had an imp. This is a Mark III, so it's after Chrysler increased their stake in the Roots Group, and I think by this stage they actually owned it in its entirety. So they actually kind of simplified things, maybe modernised things, but these aren't as well regarded, I don't think, as something like a Mark II. But the design is, is still very much similar to the one that came out in 1963. Certainly for the time, this would have looked uh, very sort of modern and up to the minute. The visibility looks astonishingly good. It's a very, very small car, actually. Um, I know these were rival to the Mini, but I'm sure that it's going to be a bit more spacious than somebody like me. I find Minis very, very cramped. I mean, Minis are, are great. Um, but I do find them a bit compromised in certain areas. So if we can open up this uh, characteristic hatch. They solved the issue of having the uh, sort of rear engine and the lack of the boot space by just putting this hatch in, which is a very, very clever way around things. And there we go. It's not massive in here, but 
you know, you could put some stuff onto the back seat as well if you wanted to. I think that's absolutely fine. So, rear engined. 875 cc's made by a company called Coventry Climax based on a fire pump engine about 39 horsepower you could get a 998 cc imp or imp derivative there were absolutely billions of imp derivatives um, made because the Roots Group loved to badge engineer stuff but the uh, most basic engine fitted to most of them was the 875 cc so we take a look um, inside. Lovely sort of period colour this. To my eyes, this doesn't look too bad. I mean, it's not quite as nice as a Mark II dash or anything like that. You can see the recording equipment is in here as well. Um, if you think my video is terrible, then you can come and drive this very car and make one that's better. Um, there's the solution to your problems. Uh, choke lever is right down on the floor. It's a bit like uh, an old Fiat 500, that's similar. And uh, reverse is down and to the left, that's going to be interesting. Also Krabash gearbox in this, which is very unusual for a little car like this. Not, not, a, not a given at all um, in 1963 when they were launched. Very, very simple engineering. There's not really an awful lot to sort of say about that thing. It's a big steering wheel. I prefer it to say Hillman on it, but this one doesn't. So they've only got one stalk, I think that's for the indicators, um, what lights and wipers are up here. For some reason it's got an enormous oil pressure light, I don't really know why. Um, it's just the way it is, I think if you bought uh, something like a Sunbeam Stiletto or something like that, you've got a, you know, a, a, you know more, more instruments than this. There's the, the uh, fuel and temperature gauge, 6 gallon fuel tank. Uh, imagine that's where a radio would have been if you had a radio fitted. Funny kind of hard vinyl dash up here. Um, we've got sort of cream vinyl in here. Is this beige or cream viewers? I think it's cream. We've also got a really, really massive door pocket for all these sort of maps you're going to need because we're in the days of no sat nav. Strange um, position of both the um, uh, ignition barrel here and also the pedals are right over to the left presumably to keep as much sort of a boot space as possible and did a big wheel arch, in, wheel arch intrusion so we've got uh, various controls for the uh, heater in there I don't think we're going to be using that today because I'm not going to be driving it for very long um, that looks like it was um, some sort of extra glove box or something just two could Controls on here, uh, one's for getting in and out of the car, and one is uh, the window winder. So, not really an awful lot to say in here. Let's see if we can uh, open up the uh, engine compartment lid. So, there's two of these you've got to do, and then it should just lift up. Maybe. There we go. So, very advanced for the time, um, it's actually an all aluminium engine. The cylinder head and the block are all aluminium and with the early ones they did have a lot of problems with overheating. I think it might have been due to sort of poor maintenance or the fact that it was built in an all new factory uh, up near Glasgow, a place called Linwood, um, with an all new workforce who weren't used to working on cars. Very very bizarre method of um, you know production in fact they had to sort of take I think take the the cars down to Coventry with some fine assembly and then bring them back or something like that. Either way, it was a total waste. Um, really, really sort of strange. I think it, the factory was built up in Scotland because of government subsidies, uh, a bit like a DeLorean, that sort of idea. But uh, yeah, cantered over in there. It's a very sort of interesting situation. It's very, very different for something like a Mini where everything's at the front versus everything's at the back. Um, yeah. Fascinating. Right, Mr. Manning from Matty's Car says I have to get in the back. And, um, oh, so I will. Oh, gosh. Ooh. Oh, this is going to land on my feet, isn't it? Uh, that's not good, viewers. Um, the seats don't really adjust at all. And uh, there's a tiny, tiny lever down there, a little yellow thing. 
Um, I wouldn't want to go really much distance in here at all, unless I was a lot shorter. Um, yeah, it, it's the problem is today's so cold, the vinyl's cold as well. You've got some sort of later speakers in the back, maybe from the 1980s. Um, but yeah, it's okay, I mean, Mini's not great in that respect either, it's amazing that these cars are as spacious as they are, really. Um, yeah, the visibility is just amazing in this. The glass area is fantastic. You can see why loads of um, you know, driving schools would have used a car like this back in the day. So, this is the front boot, frunk, fruit, whatever you want to call it. It's more common these days on electric cars, isn't it, to have that term. But there were some imps actually imported to the United States of America, which, which really surprised me when I was doing research on this car. Um, so they did actually take them over. You can see we're in the Chrysler era, so it's a 71 car this, so um, when Chrysler had a full ownership of the Roots Group. Do we have a bag for windscreen washer fluid? Uh, I think we do. So spare tyre in there as well, and uh, there is the brake fluid top up there. Tools in there, it's, it's, the, the front boot's not as big as I thought it would be actually. I thought it would be a little bit bigger than this but then you've got the stowage behind the um, behind the rear seats as well so for a little car like this it is quite space efficient and just a very sort of engineering led design. Just It's a shame that when they actually brought these out in 63 they absolutely rushed it to the market to get it finished and just have all these quality problems with the, uh, the early Mark 1s. Um, but, you know, never mind. It's amazing to see this one is in such good condition, considering how old it is. Right, uh, time to go for another drive, I think. So the Mark 1 imp lasted until 65, played for the Mark 2, with some design changes, and then also with the... Um, two stops on the dash which looked very confusing in the brochures. I used to have a book which had the picture of the Mark II dash in it and oh my gosh I could not work out what was going on at all. This Mark III has a much simpler dash and just sort of simplified styling although by 1976 when we discontinued this really in favour of the Chrysler Sunbeam which also used um, a, a version of this engine it was like a 928cc version of this engine. Um, this was looking like a very very dated car indeed. Though the Mini kept going, this didn't, you know, with uh, all the problems that Chrysler Europe had by that stage. Um, one of the ways to save money was killing off the M, which I think some people were really sad about. I can see why people like these cars. If you can get, you can get used to this gearbox and, uh, you know, you like the very accurate steering. The steering is very, very accurate indeed. It's incredibly easy to place the car where you want it, and it just sort of slides through this slalom with really no problems at all. It's very, very easy like this. You've got to twirl the wheel a bit, but then you've got to twirl the wheel in most old cars with that power steering. The ride is a bit crashy. I'm, um, <laughs> I'm a bit sort of disconcerted by how sub crashy it is, but then again, if you're driving an old Mini um, with the rubber cone suspension, then that's pretty crashy too, so no surprises there. It was, uh, yeah, just funny the, the things people tried back in the day in terms of the engineering. After they kissed the Gonus with the Mini, transmission in sump and rubber cone suspension, root screw with this car, rear engine, rear wheel drive, all synchro mesh gearbox, aluminium cylinder head and block. You know, they, they took some risks. Um, I don't think engineering these days necessarily is um, sort of adventurous sometimes. So viewers, let's go over the extremely confusing um, load of interest. Let's adjust the camera slightly. There we go. There we go. It's better. Um, so the Hillman Husky, that was the estate version. Um, then we've got the Singer Shamwan, Singer Imp. A lot of people have called it that. The Sunbeam Imp Sport. The Sunbeam Stiletto. The Stiletto was sort of the coupe version. The Hillman Imp Californian. I think most of the Californians were like the Stiletto. They were coupes. 
the Comma Imp van that was later renamed to the Hillman Imp van in 1968. Um, this is a Super Imp. I don't know what's super about it. It seems pretty basic to me. Um, the Caledonian was like a late special edition with lots of the extras thrown in for free. That was around 75, 76. The cars were made in, um, apart from uh, Linwood in Scotland, um, Australia, Costa Rica. Uh, this list comes from Wikipedia, so it might be dubious as to uh, actually, um, <laughs> well, how true this is. Uh, Republic of Ireland, Malaysia, Malta, New Zealand, Portugal, South Africa, Venezuela and Uruguay. So viewers, uh, should you consider a Hillman Imp as a nostalgic classic for between one and five thousand pounds? Well, I'm getting nostalgic vibes um, myself. My family used to own one of these, even though I never saw it uh, back in the 70s. Um, and compared with the Mini, I I'm really maybe not um, going to be very safe in saying this, but I think I prefer one of these. Um, no surprise, you know, Steph and my driver classic, she drove this very car in 2021 and she quite liked it too, so perhaps I'm in good company. Um, anyway, thank you ever so much indeed once again for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video, leave a comment below, and we shall see you again soon for more reasonably priced nostalgic motoring. Thank you.